Thank you. Hi, I'm Jody Rundle, and I'm married to Alan. Um, as many of you know, I have a balance disorder, which is why I walk with a cane. I woke up one morning in the spring of 2009, and my life was forever changed. The room was spinning, and it wouldn't stop. That lasted on and off for about three months, and eventually developed into the chronic illness I live with now. I could no longer work or drive. Most days, I could not walk without support, and some days, I could not walk at all. My symptoms fluctuated in variety, intensity, and duration, so I never knew from one day to the next what I would be able to do. During my darkest days, when all I could do was sit in one place propped up on the couch, I would begin to feel desperate, despairing, and angry about my situation. I couldn't do anything but pray. I would ask God, why? Why? Why is this happening? What possible purpose could this serve? What good could come from this? During one of these times, God gave me a vision. In this vision, I'm in a pit. I'm hanging onto the wall of it. It's dark, it's damp, and it's musty. The walls feel like dirt, and they are bumpy and slimy. I can hear other people in there with me, whimpering, moaning, and crying. They are also hanging on, afraid of falling at any moment, like me. Fear begins to overwhelm me. But Jesus is in the pit with me, hanging on to a rope. I know that he can rescue me from my fear. I know that he can save me. I just need my faith, and I need to put my faith into action by letting go of the wall and jumping into his arms trusting him to catch me. It's a very, very difficult thing to do to let go of the wall because it seems that the wall is what is keeping me from falling. But Jesus is beckoning me, so I jump. I push away from the wall as hard as I can. He catches me, and I am safe in his arms. He smiles at me, and I am comforted. He carries me up the rope and out of the pit, and I am rescued. And he does this as many times as I need him to. Through this whole experience, God has taught me so much. He has taught me to trust him more and more, to let go of my pride and ask for help when I need it, to get my sense of self-worth from being his child and not from what other people think of me to count my blessings and not my problems, to have more compassion for other people and how to better minister to them, to let others see me let go of the wall and jump into the arms of Jesus with the hope that they might be able to as well. He taught me that sometimes, most times, there is no why. He has provided for me the help and treatment I need, yes, but especially a wonderful husband who walks this path with me, and a wonderful family, including my church family, who also helped me with this burden. And he continues to teach me and Alan through this experience. God has turned this chronic illness into a blessing because he has made beautiful things happen as a result of it. And I am so thankful to him for that. Thank you, Jody, for sharing. Because of the subject this morning as we're looking at, as was read, Mark chapter 5, I thought there's no better introduction than a testimony of somebody who's been living in a similar kind of situation. This morning's passage is found as was read in Mark chapter 5, but it begins actually in chapter 4, a day or two beforehand, and we looked at those scenarios that have happened in the last 
24 to 48 hours of Jesus' life as he gets into a boat and they're starting to go eastward across the Sea of Galilee to the other side, which is a Gentile side. As they're making their way there, they encounter a storm. And it's there that Jesus calms the storm with the word, the wind dies, the waves are calm, and then they're on the other side. The other side is a cemetery, and there is a demon-possessed man there. And that's the second scenario, and we looked at that last week. But in all of this, the kind of the focus verse for this is really back in chapter 4, where after the calming of the waves and the wind, and at verse 41, the disciples are terrified. That means they're trembling. They're fearful of what they have encountered. No, no, not even what they have, who they are now encountering in this person. And they say, who is this man? And it's a question that has been asked for centuries, for millennium, for over 2,000 years. It's a con- question that has continued to be asked today. Who, who is Jesus? And there is a seminar that is put on or had been put on in the late 90s and into the 2000s called the Jesus Seminar where they would get together and they would begin to ask this question. And then they would go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and begin to pick out, well, what is it that Jesus actually said, and what is it that he actually did, and what's made up? What's story? And they get down to a very few sentences. But I profess and proclaim and declare, if you want to know who Jesus is, read the Bible. You don't have to go to a seminar, you don't have to watch a video, you don't have to go to YouTube, you don't have to Google, you just go to the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest, and you will discover who Jesus is. We need go no further than the inspired word of God to discover all we need to know about Jesus. The problem is, we don't want to accept the answer often. We don't want to accept the answer because when we are confronted with the answer of who Jesus is, we must then bend our knee and bow because he is Lord. He is the Son of God, took on flesh, lived on this earth, went to the cross, died for our sins as the precious, unblemished, pure Lamb of God, was in the grave for three days, rose again in victory, ascended into the heavens, and one day will return. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We don't like the answer because it places us into a position of submission. He is Lord. We live in a culture and a society that doesn't like authority. We don't, especially in the prairies, about those people that live, I don't know where I am, east, go in the door, east. further than that. (laughs) I know there's some Tobins here, so I'm just going to skip over that one. There's a backstory behind that, but we move on. We don't like the answer largely because if we accept the answer, it means that we need to kneel. Earlier in this Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man, that he is the one and he is the one alone who has the authority to forgive sins. 
The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law did not like that. They did not like what he was saying about himself. And they sought to do him harm, to discredit him, to find fault with him, to declare him a liar, demon-possessed, crazy. His family even came and said, well, we know he's a little off, so we're just kind of here to take him away and protect him. They didn't use those words, but he's nuts. People didn't like what Jesus was saying about who he was. And I want to include, and why I set this up, is that the people who were there declaring who Jesus, they were fighting against him, they were going against him, they were saying, well, he's not really the son of God, he's not really born of a virgin, he's not really pure, he's not really. One of those was probably this guy named Jarius. See, Jarius lived in the hometown, he was the person who was in charge of the synagogue. He would be much uh, like Gary or uh, Chad or someone who's on the board of elders and they're in charge of leading the church. They were possibly a Levite, possibly of the priestly lineage, but we know that he was a big guy up in the synagogue, in the church. And earlier in the Gospels of Mark, we read that when Jesus had healed a man who had a crippled hand in church, I'm going to use church instead of synagogue because it helps us, in church on a Sunday or the Sabbath, okay, I'll get, I'll get ready, in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and they didn't like that. And they didn't like his teaching. And Jairus was probably one of those. And this would have been about a year earlier as Jesus is beginning his ministry early in the Gospel of Mark. And now over the past year, he has been doing a lot of things, including John chapter 4 and John chapter 5, where he meets a man of prominence in the community. He is a centurion in charge of the Roman guards in Capernaum, the city of Jesus where he lived and where this event is now happening. So he knew of these things. He was one of those who was probably against Jesus, but something shifted in his life. His daughter got really sick and she was about to die. Isn't it amazing what kids can, can how they affect us? And when they're sick, you get sick for them. You want, you want every, everything you can do, you will do to help them to get better. But this man was, he, he couldn't do anything. And have you ever been in that helpless place? That helpless place? I, if I could take it, I would take it on myself. I feel helpless with regards to my wife so many times. As she lays there, not more recently, but in the past, she would sit or she'd lay and she'd be crying and she just, tears coming down. And I, I ache and I want to take it. The place of helplessness, and the place of fear. Because he's fearing his daughter's death. So Jesus has been across the lake. He's freed this man, this demon-possessed man. He's calmed the storm. And we've looked over the last two weeks how Jesus fits, that he, in, in the calming of the storm, that he's in the boat with us, the storms of life. He's in the boat with us. And when we go to him and say, Lord, don't you care? He says, well, of course I care calms the wind and the waves. And then he steps into the world of this demon-possessed man. And he has shown his authority over the created world. He now shows his authority over the spiritual world. And he casts the demons out of this man. 
And now he gets back in the boat, he goes across the lake again, and all of this has happened probably within about a 24 to 48 hour period. And now he steps on the shore and the crowd's waiting, the crowd that he left. And we see that there is a man there whose daughter is sick, even to dying. And remember that the religious people, the religious leaders of that community were against Jesus. But now we have this man, Jarius, or Jarius. And I believe that he is named as there are others who are named in Scripture. Other times we see a woman, a man, a centurion. A, but here we have a name. And this man, I think, and others have indicated he is probably much like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where he believes in God, he is very open to the reality of who Jesus is, and at some point, he does become a part of the followers of Jesus Christ. And Mark here is going, you know Jarius, go and ask him if this is true. They would know him, and he would be a part of the congregation, and he can give testimony to what God has done, much like the wife of the pastor came and gave a testimony, and her name is, her name is, her name is, say it, thank you. She's not the wife of the pastor. For a lot of years, she was struggling with her identity issue. She was always Alan's wife, the pastor's wife. So I point out, no, that's Jody. That's Jarius. You know Jarius. And Jarius is there and something, we know the something, the something is his his daughter. And he goes and he comes and he kneels before Jesus and he says, please come heal my daughter. And he's begging. And Jesus goes, well, of course. And he's on his way. And the crowds are around and they're pushing and shoving and they're trying to to get, Jesus, will you touch me? Jesus, will you touch me? Will you heal me? Will you come and free my son? Will you come and do this? Will you come and do that? Will you bless me? Will you something? Will you something? You can see the crowds just coming in. This is a prayer shawl. This is probably not what Jesus was wearing, but I brought it because it has a feature on it that the Gospel of Luke points out much more vividly than it does in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, it says that she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment, which is probably maybe perhaps a part of his coat, the bottom edge of his coat, just, just a piece of cloth. But in the Gospel of Luke, he very specifically points out that it's a thread, and it's the prayer threads that we read about in the Pentateuch. And it's just that she touched, just just the thread. Okay, now I know you're a very sensitive man, right? Yeah. If, if I was to come up and, and just... Okay, close your eyes. I'm going to touch your clothing somewhere. I want you to tell me where I'm touching you. (laughs) Did it work? No, No, of course not. I mean, anybody, and, and, and that's the disciples' reaction. They're going, Jesus, what are you talking about, Jesus? How can, there's people that are bumping into you, and he said, well, somebody has touched And I have felt the power go from me. And this woman who had this sickness of 12 years just slips her hand through and just touches the thread. Just the thread. And she's healed. 
A little bit of a background here on this woman. She's had this for 12 years. She has spent everything she could to be cured of it. What is the it that she is suffering from? She's on her menstrual cycle for 12 years. This would make her sick. I'm not a woman. I don't know. I just go by what I know from my wife back in the day. Menstrual cramps are not good. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Guys, amen. We know. But not only has she been feeling this pain and this experience for 12 years, according to Levitical law, she is unclean. And technically, according to Levitical law, she is to remove herself to a place apart from other people outside of the village, outside of her home. She's not been able to go home for 12 years. Not only that, but it makes her unclean and not able to go to church for 12 years. And she's not only spent everything, she is not only in isolation, she is not only deprived of the social amenities that we take for granted and coming to church that we take for granted, but she has been in this isolated state and has spent everything. It's not getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. Can you sense the heart and mind and desperation of this woman. And yet her faith, be it ever so small, in just going to hang on by a thread. And clinging to the muddy, dirty, musty wall She reaches to Jesus, who is on the rope, and says, I trust you, and takes the thread, and the power leaves. Now, Jesus instantly knows, and he says, somebody touched me and took power away from me, and the disciples are going, are you crazy? Are you nuts? How can you tell? Could you tell where I was touching you? No, any reasonable person would just go, impossible. But Jesus goes through the impossible. He says, someone touched me. He looks around, and now he is looking for this this woman. We assume that he knows that it's a woman. I think he knows who it is. And she now knows that he knows that it's her because I think he's got the laser-born eye. And he says, who touched me? And she falls down at his feet and says, it's me. And what is Jesus' response to her? Daughter. The only time he ever calls a woman daughter. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of comfort. It's a term of compassion. He says, daughter, your faith, she's had faith, even be it just so small, has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. Now, I make a big deal about that because it's a big deal. Who is Jesus going with to see the daughter? Who's he going with? Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. Now, you see, in this woman touching Jesus, he now becomes unclean. 
And he cannot go into anyone's home or into the synagogue until after sundown. And here Jarius has come and he is pleading, Come, heal my daughter. She's nearly dead. Jesus, come into my home. Jesus, I am the leader. Everybody knows who he is. He's got his own robes. He's got his own attire. Everybody knows the leader of the synagogue. And they have just seen this unclean woman, who I think everybody knows as well. She's been there for 12 years. Same age as the daughter. Interesting. And this Jesus, his last hope, his last hope for his daughter has just been made unclean by that woman. That's what I would think. And the despair turns into hopelessness because now Jesus can't even come and do that. But Jesus turns to the man and he says, well, let's go. And they kept walking. He made everybody stay back. And as they begin going back or going again to Jairus or Jairus' home, it shows a great extent of the faith and the willing of the cost that Jairus is willing to pay for his daughter to be healed. His reputation is at stake. His job is at stake. Everything is on the line with this. And he says to this now unclean rabbi healer, keep coming. And as they are making their way, news comes, don't bother. She's dead. Why bother the guy anymore? If I was Jarius, I would, I would go, that woman, look, she delayed you? That woman has made you unclean. It's her fault that my daughter is dead now, but no. what does I, I can see a lot of happening going on here in this scenario. But Jesus then says what? Don't be afraid, verse 36. Only believe. Faith. Faith. Faith plays a huge part in our being followers of Jesus Christ. It's faith that makes us to be good soil. It's by grace we are saved through faith. In Galatians we read that we are justified by faith, that we are to live by faith, And Hebrews says, faith is being sure of what we hope for. The absolute confidence that God is who he said he is, that Jesus is who he is, and that they will do what they have said they will do. I believe And never is it more clearly shown in the act of the woman. In her desperation, by faith she reaches out and is healed. It is put kernel, little seed, in Jarius. And that seed, I think, is beginning to shrivel a little bit as now he sees this woman make this healer unclean. Oh no. But Jesus bolsters bolsters his faith a little bit and says, let's keep going. The word comes that she is dead, and he says, let's keep going. And I think in part, a very small part, the healing of the woman was meant to encourage Jairus that indeed Jesus would do what he was asked. Jarius, you've just seen 
what I've done with this woman. And that's by her faith in touching a thread. I'm going to come and I'm going to do as you ask and lay hands on your daughter. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Believe in what? Believe what your eyes have seen. Believe the words that I have said. Believe in that kernel, that grain of faith that is planted in you that caused you to come to me in the first place. Don't be afraid. Let go of the slimy wall and take my hand. I'll catch you. Just believe. Don't be afraid of what these voices are saying. And so they make their way and they've said, stay back to the rest of the people and Peter, James, and John go with them and they make their way and they make their way into the house and there are the mourners. And these aren't necessarily the mourners of the family. These are women who, well, they're paid to cry. Give them a few bucks and they'll cry up a storm. Give them a few more bucks and they'll wail their hearts out. Give them a few more bucks and they'll start tearing their clothes and throwing ashes in the air and they'll do a really good job of crying for you. And you wonder how they can change that quickly from going into mourning and to jeering and criticizing Jesus because Jesus comes up and says, why are you crying? And they go, because she's dead. She's dead. And he goes, no, she's not. She's just asleep. ha <laughs> ha. That means we're not going to get paid? That means what we've been doing is, you're nuts, you're crazy. We've been there. We know. We've seen it. We're paid to cry at times like this. We know. We're the professional. And Jesus turns to the man again. He says, come on. And they go into the house, and there he takes the hand of the child, and he lifts her up. And it says they're utterly astonished. Who is this man? Who is this man who calms the waves? and stills the wind. He's the one who's in the boat with us. Who is this man who steps into our pig-infested, dark, dank cemetery and comes and frees us by stepping into our world from that which binds us? with a word. Who is this man who in compassion and tenderness says to a woman of sickness of 12 years, go in peace, your faith has healed you, and walks with the man into a morgue and says she's not asleep, or she's not dead, she's just asleep. And takes his hand, the hand of this woman, this girl. And she gets up. Who is this man? His name is Jesus. The son who has been given authority over all things. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is able to forgive He is in the boat with us during the storms of life and He steps into our world when we feel that all is lost. And He reaches out and He takes our hand. And He says, believe and have peace. Jesus' answer to fear, 
faith all the way through. Jesus answered, a fear is faith. And you don't need to go any further to discover who he is and what he can do than the scriptures that we have before us. Do you want to know this God, this Christ, this Jesus? Read his word. Do you want to know this God, this Christ, this Lord Jesus? Submit your life, your heart, your mind, your soul, your body. And say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Lord, I need you because only you can forgive and cleanse me of my sins. Lord, I need you because only you can step into my world and help me to navigate through these events. Only you can give me peace. Peace between myself and God. Peace between myself and others. Peace in myself with myself. Only you can give that peace. I had Jody share... Because she's not been healed. I don't know why. God will heal some and God will not heal others. God may heal partially. I don't know. I don't have the answer. I'm not God. Ask him when you get there. But I do know this. That in the midst of the storms, he says, peace be still. That in the midst of the chaos and the, the, the chains and the, the cemetery, he says, be free. And in the midst of our sorrow and our suffering and our loss, he says, believe, have peace. And Jody and myself, have had a peace that passes understanding that guards our hearts and minds, we cannot explain because the world doesn't know how to get this or to give it. But we cling on to the wall that is slimy and muddy and this pit that we can so easily slip down. And Jesus voice says don't be afraid believe in me let go of the wall take hold of my hand and I will give you peace peace God's peace peace that is greater than all I can understand. He is Lord of heaven and earth, that which is above and in and below. He is Lord. Who is this man? He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, before all you were, and in a word you created, and we are, and you chose to come and walk amid, among us as you took on the form of us, man. And you provided the way for us to return to be with the one who created us, our loving Heavenly Father. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, 
and no one comes to the Father but by me. And Lord, through you we come by faith, we confess, we believe, we acknowledge, and proclaim that you are Lord. And if any of us feel like we're clinging on to the wall of the pit, take hope and encouragement through the testimony of a woman who had a sickness of 12 years, of a father whose child was declared dead, of a man who had thousands of demons in him and was freed, of the disciples who saw Jesus calm a storm with a word, take encouragement of a woman named Jody, who like so many cling to the wall and hear the voice of Jesus. Just turn and let go and take hold of the hand of the one who loves them. Father, thank you for this great gift. And we may not be healed, our problem may not be solved in a word or a whisper or a moment, it may take time. But in all and through all, Lord, you give us peace. Oh, to give us peace that passes understanding. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.